All right, there we go. So good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Winning the War on Employee Turnover with Puzzle HR. In today's competitive business landscape, retaining and developing your most important asset, your human capital, is an ongoing challenge that can significantly impact your organization's success. And as the battle for talent continues to intensify, organizations like yours are seeking innovative strategies and solutions to reduce employee turnover, boost employee engagement, and ultimately ensure your workforce remains a driving force for growth and excellence. This webinar has been designed to equip you with the insights, tools, and expertise needed to not only win the war on employee turnover, but to emerge as a leader in nurturing and harnessing the future potential of human capital. So join us today as we delve into the effective strategies, best practices, and actionable insights that will empower you to cultivate a workforce culture where employees are not just retained, but also thrive and continue, contribute to their best. So thanks again for joining us. And without further ado, let's explore the strategies to transform your workforce and win the war on employee turnover. So now I would like to welcome the team from Puzzle HR, HR business partner with 18 years of HR experience, Michelle Gomez, and with 25 years of experience in marketing, sales management, leadership and sales consulting, regional sales manager, Sean Herr. Thank you so much, Beth. Really appreciate that. Very excited to be here. As a member of Bama, I just want to thank Bama again for the opportunity to spend a little bit of time this morning um, with the group on this call to talk about something that's all near and dear to all of us uh, that we're hearing day in and day out, and that's winning the war on employee turnover, as Beth had mentioned. Um, we'll go ahead and transition over to the agenda, what we're going to dive into this morning. Um, before we get into the specific topics, I just want to make sure that everyone on this call is, you know, able to ask the questions that they would like. If there's something that's pressing you that you're, you're hearing from us, please interrupt us. We'd be more than happy to discuss it. If it's something more at length that we want to get into, maybe we can save it for the end for Q&A or even take it offline if need be. Um, but let's make sure we have some fun and enjoy the time we have. I know we have till 1145. So we'll go ahead and start. Um, before uh, looking at the four topics, I would like to give um, just a welcome for Michelle Gomez. Beth had mentioned uh, Michelle. I just would like to give you the floor for a quick second if you'd like to introduce yourself uh, and say anything before we dive in. Um, sure, sure. Thank you both, Beth and Sean. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Michelle Gomez. I um, work for Puzzle HR as an HR business partner. So I work with our clients very closely on their HR initiatives. Been in HR for about 18 years, and I actually started in pharmaceutical uh, in a pharmaceutical manufacturer. So uh, this is an industry that is near and dear to my heart. It was my start in HR. So um, I do know some of the challenges that some of you may experience uh, with regards to you know, the employee life cycle, if you will. So I'm um, excited to be here, excited about the topics and uh, happy to join Sean. Thank you, Michelle. I'll just add to that real quickly. As Beth had mentioned, I have about 25 years sales and sales management experience. Um, I've been in the HCM human capital space, if you will, for 10 years now. I've uh, been at Puzzle for two and a half years. Prior to Puzzle, I was with Paychex um, for about eight years on the PEO side, their bundled solution. Um, where you leverage a federal ID uh, to get access to large group benefits. Some of you may be familiar with that. Had my 215 license for UHC, Blue Cross, and Aetna sold throughout the country. Um, prior to my 10 years at um, in the HEM space, I was in industrial distribution, thus the passion I have for Bama. I was uh, in the MRO OEM space, working in the industrial business distribution side for 3M, so working from anything from woodworking, metalworking, fab shops, specialty vehicle, aerospace, and ensuring they had the consumables to produce the product. So um, I'm very familiar with the manufacturing space, have been on the floor doing a number of demos over my lifetime, and enjoy very much working with manufacturing, which is so important for our economy. Um, prior to the industrial distribution, I was with IBM, and I'm also a United States Air Force veteran. So that is the introductions. Thank you again for that. Um, we are looking at the agenda now. So what we're going to dive into first is onboarding versus orientation. 
Okay, and really the difference in the two, I think a lot of us may think onboarding and orientation are the same. And then we'll transition over to what a good best practice looks like for the first 90 days of employment and why that is so important. First impressions, that first period of employment is a make or break period, if you will. And a lot of us have probably experienced that or witnessed that, if you will. Then we'll transition over to performance management. And then lastly, best practices for employee engagement. All right, transitioning to the next slide. We are looking at the need this morning. And what is the need? The need is retaining the talent, right? We wanna make sure those folks we're ringing in the door are not leaving. We wanna reduce that turnover. So what is the stat? What are we hearing about employee turnover? According to SHRM, okay, the Society for Human Resource Management, the cost of employee turnover can be as high as 90% of their salary. I know many on this call that is near and dear to your heart. It is extremely expensive and costly to organizations when someone comes in and they are gone very quickly, very expensive to rinse and repeat. The work that we need to discuss about reducing turnover, we have four listed here. I would like the audience to know this is not the end all be all, right? These four things will not stop turnover completely. However, this will impact it dramatically and it will have a big effect on reducing turnover. Okay, so we're looking at um, those four areas we talked about earlier on the agenda. What is the result once we apply the things we're getting into? You're really going to see a transformed business, which becomes an employer of choice, right? A lot of us may have heard that term, employer of choice. That is where employees want to be. It's where they're excited, and it's where they want to stay over the competition. And the win, ultimately, at the end of the day, is you're going to have engaged employees who take pride in their employer, resulting in reduced turnover and ultimately better profits for the business, all right? So we like to just huddle up real quick before we get into the onboarding specifics and orientation and talk about some common mistakes that we may have witnessed or may have been a part of, right? So when you look at this list here, one that jumps out of us is no written orientation or onboarding plan. We will be getting into some specifics so about- have... We will be getting into some specifics. Of, I think somebody's maybe off of mute. Um, we will getting in. We'll be getting into some specifics about onboarding and orientation. But how many of us have actually seen an organization been part of one, or maybe it's ours right now, or we just don't have an orientation plan that's written? Maybe it's too much HR, meaning HR manager, HR director, HR generalist. Maybe it's the COO, CFO is actually driving the onboarding and orientation. It needs to be a collaborative peer-to-peer uh, -peer partnership in onboarding new employees. There are peers that are going to be involved in the mentor and the onboarding and orientation program, which we'll talk about. Um, there needs to be the manager that's consistently communicating. We'll get into that. And then also rolling down, you're going to see some important ones here, overloading the new employee, maybe cutting onboarding too short. Using a one-size-fits-all approach, that's something we see a lot as well. We all know each business is unique. Each position is unique. Each individual is unique. Each industry can be unique. Therefore, there needs to be a customized or tailored onboarding program to fit those needs. All right. So now what we're looking on on the next slide is really a layout of the distinguishing traits of orientation and onboarding. I'd like to pause just out of curiosity. You heard me mention earlier about trying to keep this a little bit inter interactive and having some fun. If there's anyone on this call that would like to share their thoughts on orientation and onboarding, maybe being one and the same, not being aware that they were actually different in nature, would anybody like to add a little bit of input on their experience or what their take is on the two, if you will? If not, that's okay. All right, we will go ahead and move on. So on the left, you're gonna see orientation, okay? Orientation typically occurs first, right? It's the first step where the employee comes in, okay? This is where they're gonna fill out those forms and templates. They're gonna ensure, we're gonna ensure as, as an employer 
that they're ready to receive their compensation. It's task oriented. That is what the focus of orientation is. Most times orientation is going to be a one-time event. It may take one or two days, three days, but typically the duration is fairly quick and it's a one-time event. Where does it occur? It can occur in multiple multiple uh, avenues, right? Online or work site, uh, on the um, area of employment, okay? Um, what is it involved? The new hire paperwork, the benefits enrollment. You're seeing the personnel file paperwork, maybe issuing of equipment, right? Accessing uh, the company systems and reviewing handbooks and policies and confirming they've acknowledged that, right? And the results, the employee is compliant, they have what they need to move forward with onboarding and training, okay? Now where the big lift comes in and where we see a disconnect with a lot of organizations is thinking that orientation is the one and done and that employee is, is now part of the organization, right? So I think a lot of us have maybe had an experience where we start a new position or we know somebody who started a position and they are welcomed and they are giving a laptop um, maybe introduced to their manager and they'll say, let us know if you have any questions, right? And they're floundering for the first week or two. That employee Bless. is going to go home in the evening and at the dinner table, they're going to have second thoughts about the commitment they made to their new organization. They're not going to feel engaged. They're not going to feel like anyone knows them. They're going to feel like what they went through on the interviewing process is not what they're seeing in the day-to-day, -day, right? Versus the alternative if you have a true onboarding roadmap, a true onboarding process, this is where the employee is gonna understand the company role, the company culture, the vision, how they're gonna advance through the company. Um, they're also going to understand that this is gonna take longer than a week, right? There's gonna be constant communication. When a true onboarding program is put into place, okay? Instead of going home and feeling disengaged and feel like that employee's made the wrong choice, is having buyer's remorse, the people they were interviewing or calling them and asking them if they landed in a new position and they'll say, well, you know what I did, but I'm not happy with it. The other side of that is if they have a true onboarding program, they're going to be excited. They're going to say, they know who I am. They want me to be successful. They care about me. They're communicating with me regularly and they're giving me the tools that I need to succeed. Michelle, would you like to add anything um, to these two areas before we move on? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think you hit a lot of the main points um, on the head there, Sean, but I think one of the other common misconceptions and, you know, some of you may come from an organization that has no HR person. Maybe there is an office manager who handles HR tasks. Some of you may be coming from, you know, uh, an organization that has one or two HR folks that, again, wear multiple hats within the HR arena. And some of you may be fortunate enough to have an entire HR team. But regardless of where you stand in your HR structure, I think, um, you know, there's a there's a misconception that orientation and or onboarding are solely an HR, a responsibility of HR, when in fact, a true onboarding plan really encompasses a variety of different players. So yes, HR is definitely the key facilitator in this new hire's uh, onboarding process, but you have everywhere from IT to security, safety, and then of course, that new employee's department, which is is going to be their home. You know, the company is their home, but then that department are these people that they're going to interact with day in and day out. And they play such an important role in getting that person assimilated into not just the company culture, but, you know, even who to call for things. Um, so I think that's a, a very important piece. And I just, I like to give, provide some examples because I think it kind of, you know, makes this a little bit more realistic in terms of how you can incorporate a true onboarding plan. And I think you know, if you're sitting at a company right now that doesn't have a structured onboarding plan, I think the key is to start simple, right? Do a gap analysis. Whoever Whoever's involved in your onboarding process, conduct a gap analysis and see, okay, here's where we're at. Here's what we currently do. And here's what we would like to do eventually. Um, you know, I think, you know, with one of my clients in particular that, that comes to mind um, that they're in the traffic safety arena, they um, they do like road signage and, and it very, it's a very particular niche. And, um, you know, they, they came to us and said, you know, we need help. We have a high turnover. Um, we don't know what we're doing wrong. And in looking at it, a lot of the folks were leaving because they simply just didn't have the communication or didn't feel they had the proper communication from all of the important players from the onset of their employment. 
So, you know, just thinking of them as the example, I can tell you that we did a gap analysis, we started simple, and then we built an SOP and a procedure for onboarding. And then from there, it's important to note that we had to lay out who's responsible for what. So, okay, yes, HR starts it, but then in, in between that, we need assistance from all these other different departments. Um, you know, and again, depending on how your organization is structured, I'm sure most of you have some layer of IT, some layer of safety and security who also need to be involved with this new hire. Um, you know, and then of course, management. Management, um, you know, that that person's direct supervisor and or manager are key to helping welcome the person and get them involved in the department and showing them where and how to do things. So, so I think that's key. Um, other two key points I can make on this, um, leverage your, your HR and payroll system. So I think, you know, the more automated you can get, the bigger relief it is for you, um, whether you're the HR person or otherwise. Um, you know, there's so many systems out there now that can help with onboarding and automating even the documents. Um, you know, the W4I9, that can all be done through most of these HR and payroll systems nowadays. So, and even customizing, you know, other forms. Um, I have clients that have their non-competes in the HCM system. They no longer have to, um, you know, have a, have a PDF or even use, you know, DocuSign. They have it all, you know, directly through this payroll system that they can, that they can leverage. So definitely use your resources to the max. Um, you know, so that's, Definitely SOP resources such as an HR and payroll system. And then the last point I can make on this is communication. So communication is key. You can't create a process and not tell, you know, the, the people who are involved what they need to do or what their responsibility is. So with this particular company that I mentioned, that was a huge deal because many of the managers were just used to, hey, HR, this is your thing. Bring the new employee to me and just get them to work. That's all they cared about, right? So we did have to do kind of a culture shift there in getting these managers more involved in the process. Managers and coworkers, because sometimes, and, and we'll allude to this and later on in the presentation, a mentor is also very key in getting this person assimilated into the company. So, and, and the last thing I just want to point out here is, you know, um, we have Gen Zers coming into the workforce, and I'm sure most of you know, Gen Zers have no loyalty. They just want to get to the place that is going to treat them the best and where they feel the best, right? So, you know, as, as organizations, as companies, we need to make sure that we attract, this is the future of our workforce, you know, so they're all about the employee experience. So you'll even hear out there, you know, they're changing the name of human resources in some companies to the employee experience department. And that is because it's more than just the tactical, it's an experience that we want this employee to feel, you know, included, we want them to feel welcomed and that takes, that takes the whole company in participating in this. Absolutely, Michelle. Great point. Really appreciate that very much. So we're going to go ahead and transition to the next slide, which gets into some granular details about new hire orientation. So what exactly are some of those task checklist items that are involved in that first element of bringing an employee into a business? You're seeing here, it's the new hire paperwork we mentioned earlier, ensuring that they have what they need completed to get paid, to have the benefits applied to them. Um, the HRIS data entry, human resource information system. Um, Michelle mentioned that you need to leverage those, right? You're going to do that ultimately during that orientation process, whether it be ADP, Paychecks, Heartland, Paylocity. We all know the, all the different systems that are out there. You're going to be working in there, ensuring their personnel files created, making sure they have that welcome email, um, you know, welcoming them to the organization. Uh, we're seeing videos being integrated into those welcome emails more uh, in today's market as well. And then going down the list, you're seeing some more task related items for orientation. Moving on to best practices for new hire onboarding. Now, again, I mentioned earlier, this is not the end all be all. These are some best practices that we are seeing uh, applied with our clients that are really producing a lot of fruit, or a lot of results, and really bringing an engaged employee in that first 93 months first, you know, six months. And starting at the top, Michelle had mentioned a mentor. This is very important. Why is it so important? We know a coworker, a mentor is going to be received differently than a direct report manager. This is going to allow the new hire to speak to someone in confidence, right? That first, you know, week, two weeks, even the first month, it can be overwhelming. 
There can be a lot of anxiety. This allows that new hire to pick up the phone or if they're sitting side by side with their mentor, they're going to lunch with them and just share with them how they're feeling. And that gives the mentor the ability to say, that's normal. That's how I felt. And, you know, two years in now, you know, I am doing X, Y, and Z and very successful. It's going to, it's going to uh, unfold as time goes along. Just be patient. I'm here to help you along, right? That is critical. If that new hire does not have confidence to speak to anyone besides their manager about what they're dealing with, they're going to have a lot of concerns about possibly, possibly leaving or not having their concerns addressed, right? Also, a side note about the mentor. It is important to ensure that if you can assign a mentor in the like season that they're in. Obviously, if you're someone that's a younger generation, try and pair them up with a mentor that's in a like generation. And same, you know, middle and, and so forth as far as generation, maybe seasonal life, children, no children, and so on and so forth. That just brings more like-minded individuals together, okay? Also, ensure that you are scheduling regular one-on-one -on -one meetings with this new employee, and that's with their manager and mentor. Michelle mentioned earlier the importance of communication. Communication is important in life in general and in business. In every relationship, communication is everything. And with a new hire, there can be misunderstandings. There could be um, expectations that not, might not be realized, right? And this is where that is going to unfold in those regular one-on-one -on -one meetings. Also, you're going to want to establish the training for this individual in increments. Too much training at one time is not going to be healthy. We all know trying to retain what we're learning can be a challenge, right? You want to make sure that there's calendar appointments and structured time for the new hire to spend shadowing the existing resources within the company, okay? So they're going to want to sit with the shipping department. They're going to want to sit with the marketing and accounting department, the sales department, the executive management team. This allows them to see the holistic view of the organization and also meet all the individuals within the company, right? The next one you're seeing there, schedule time with the leadership. Make sure that employee has some time to sit with the leaders, someone who has some tenure, someone who's making decisions and has the vision of the company at hand. The reason that is so important, it allows them to understand where the company has been, where they're at today and where they're going tomorrow. I'll use an example at Puzzle. I was familiar with the foundation of Puzzle during our onboarding process. I sat with one of the executives and I was uh, brought up to speed on how we navigated COVID. We all know COVID is uh, still, there's still fallout from it. I was not aware of how COVID really was a springboard to a lot of growth within Puzzle HR. There was a big need for organizations to understand how to manage this new remote workforce. There was a big need for content to be um, cascaded out quickly, communicated quickly. And Puzzle was able to react quickly over our competitors. And that was just an example of when I came on uh, to Puzzle right kind of at the tail end of COVID. And I was giving that insight. And that was a big help for me. Um, and then also, you want to share the career advancement opportunities um, with that individual they want to be aware of what next step they can take if they master their existing position. That gives them hope and understanding that they master this position. There's a great opportunity for them to receive higher compensation and bigger responsibility within the organization. Lastly, I'm going to talk about celebrating and highlighting early successes. This is big. If you have an employee that is mastering something quickly or even their first or second time of owning a process or taking uh, ownership on a certain area that may be challenging and they have a win, they have a victory, that needs to be celebrated within the organization. Make sure that they're hearing that from their peers and from the company that they've just come on to work for. I'm gonna pause for a second because there's a lot of content here. Any questions, thoughts um, that you would like to discuss in this area? That's okay. We're going to go ahead and transition to the 90-day roadmap to success, right? This kind of dovetails into the onboarding. The 90-day, first 30, this roadmap, first 30, 60, 90, it's all related. Um, we like to call it the roadmap to success. 
because it, it really gives you a guideline of what needs to occur, okay? In addition to that onboarding, make sure you are reviewing with this new hire any additional resources or tools this employee may need to perform the job. Sometimes they may not have interest, right, in asking for additional tools. But if you solicit that information or that feedback from them, ask them, what are some of the challenges you're having in your day-to-day um, cadence of doing your job that you wish you could, you know, change, right? They're going to give you that feedback. Discuss their on-the-job experience so far. You want to check in with their with employees' colleagues to gain a different perspective on how they're adjusting and adapting. This is big. You may be looking at it from one lens. You're not sitting with the new hire during those shadows. You're not listening to some of the feedback. You may have a different uh, perspective on how the onboarding is going. You may think it's going great, right? When you speak to their mentor, other coworkers, they may be able to share some areas of concern that they have or fear that you may be able to course correct, okay? Extremely important. You're seeing a few at the end here. It's important to get the employee engaged, right? In the company culture, make sure you remind them, okay? Let them know there's activities that you do on a weekly basis, a monthly basis as a team. Maybe they're part of a certain department that you know do you know goes out to lunch a certain you know period during the week. Make sure you get them up to speed on that and ask for those that are leading those activities to bring in that new employee. Okay, um, Michelle, if you would like to talk uh, about the 30, 60, 90 evaluation, how important that is, and what you've done um, with some of your clients. Sure, sure, yes. So it's funny because I know that, you know, another misconception here is that, um, you know, that first 90 days is, you know, hey, this person's not working out. I just want to fire them. Um, you know, it's, it's you know, yes, it is easier to fire someone or I should say to terminate someone during their first 90 days or introductory period, as long as you have a policy in place that specifies, you know, that this is kind of like their introductory or probationary period, those first 90 days. However. I can tell you that even if they're within their first 90 days, the proper way and to avoid, you know, liability for yourselves is to still document, you know, with the person because it, it's twofold. So yes, perhaps the person is not a good fit or is not performing the way you expected them to perform within their introductory period, but maybe there's hope. Maybe, you know, maybe they're not all all bad, you know, maybe there are certain things they do need to improve so that they can catch up and, and be where they need to be at the end of the 90 days. So, so that's why we, we mentioned the 30, 60, 90, because truly you need to give that person an opportunity first, right? I mean, unless they flat out, you know, have some sort of violation of company policy or something of that nature. But when it comes to performance, you know, you really, again, want to set them up for success with the onboarding process, um, but also have that communication. So those 30, 60, 90s, are important for two reasons. One is because this is the opportunity for the manager to provide feedback to the employee on, you know, things that are going well, things that they're doing correctly, things that, you know, they're happy with, as well as areas that, you know, perhaps this person needs to improve upon. But at the same time, it's also an opportunity for that new employee to engage with their hiring manager and explain to them, you know, maybe some things that the hiring manager is not aware of. Um, I mean, I can, this is actually my pre-puzzle days when I worked in healthcare, I can tell you that, you know, um, we had a, a department in the hospital with turnover in this one particular position and it was an admin position. So we were just shocked at why this position had so much turnover. Well, finally, we had one person bold enough to come in and then step up and, and, and discuss the fact that it was actually the trainer, it wasn't the manager. It was the person who was training this, these individuals who was, you know, talking down to them, making them feel uncomfortable, um, you know, not in a discriminatory or harassment sort of way, but just in, in the way she gave directives and explanations. And so, you know, uh, the individuals who were being hired were just scared away by this person. So, um, you know, understanding that we were able to kind of come in and, and conduct some intervention you know, that person needed to be trained as well um, on, on appropriately training others. Um, so we had to kind of put her on, on a little bit of a performance improvement plan. Um, but, you know, again, without knowing something like that, we wouldn't have been able to curb that uh, 
turnover in that particular position. And thankfully, you know, we were able to catch it, but had there been some 30, 60, 90 day dialogues going on, we might've been able to catch it before going through three different individuals in the position. So that's why I feel like those are so critical. And, um, you know, if you're a company that has employees in multiple locations, I think it's also critical because the reality is even, even the hiring manager may not be aware of the day-to-day -day in some cases, if they have employees reporting to them in other locations or other offices. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I do think that those are, are key in, in getting that information, the, the two-way communication between both the manager and the new employee. Fantastic. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so we're watching the clock. We just a little bit over 10 minutes and we have two more um, categories to review, performance management and employee engagement. However, I'd like to pause and kind of just take a temperature, a pulse of the, the uh, attendees to, to ask, um, how many of you are involved or have been involved in a scenario with new hires where there is no onboarding process? There's nothing in place, if you will, to really ensure that some of these areas are being addressed. Can anyone share? Is some of this new content, is any of this striking a chord? Some open discussion, if you don't mind. Oh, well, yeah, hey, Sean. Oh, hey, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, you know, we have a division here in Tampa with corporate in New York. Uh, they don't really have HR per se, uh, just more uh, administrative oversight, even though it's, you know, rather a large company. But, uh, you know, as we've grown here with over you know, 45 people, uh, over the years, we just uh, kind of have established uh, some of these things on our own, re realizing that uh, it's uh, critical and, you know, it's make or break uh, very much uh, person's success. But of course, without some uh, you know, oversight of uh, true regulatory uh, you know, experts, <laughs> we do find we have to exercise caution and, you know, exactly maybe what you can say or not say or things you can uh, require. But overall, I mean, all these points you're uh, hitting, we certainly recognized uh, mm -hmm. the company overall did not have it. And, you know, we've uh, put more in place uh, ourselves. And I think uh, the reason a number of my managers are on here is that uh, we, you know, we want to assess uh, how we can do it better. So thanks for your comments. Yes, no, fantastic, Jeff. I really appreciate that feedback. You know, I think we're seeing a theme here, and it's one word, communication. Now, obviously, there's, there's processes and reasons for what we do with bringing somebody into an organization, but it is so critical in that first three to six months to ensure that there's regular communication and, and hitting on all these elements. That's really a big factor in whether or not these individuals are going to stay within the organization. Quint, I know you had, um, we're, we're going to say something. Yeah. Thanks again for both of your time today. This is great. Uh, just love what puzzle, puzzle HR is doing out there uh, for clients. Um, so one thing I, I see often is that, um, a lot of businesses do not assign the mentor, which I think is a great uh, point that you brought up. Um, they'll have an employee jump right in and shadow multiple different employees in different you know, fields of that organization. But I think having a veteran mentor in place is crucial um, to help them, you know, just guide them through the organization and, um, and everything. So great point on that. Yeah. And, oh, thank you, Quint. And uh, I appreciate that. I know in your personal experience at, at Heartland, you've actually been managing some new hires and it sounds like you've actually had some experience with this. So um, mentors are extremely important and it goes a long way. That mentor will stick with you for your entire lifeline, right? Uh, that you, you're with the organization. Um, so it's a great tool to apply during the process. Let's go ahead and, and transition over for the remaining time to the importance of performance management, and then we'll wrap up with employee engagement and some last minute Q&A. So performance management, right? This actually can be fun, right? If you look to the right, who, who doesn't like encouragement, right? We all need it. It's 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 big part of what we need to, to hear uh, while we're at an organization, right? That's part of performance management. Coaching, I, 
we're constantly fine tuning our craft. Me personally, I love to be coached by my mentors, my peers uh, within my organization. That's how you learn. That's how you become better, right? It allows you to address skills gaps that you may have and goal setting. You, you know, we all know that if you do not have the goals in place, right, you're not, you're going to be shooting at something that you don't even know what you're shooting at, right? Extremely important during the performance manage process to have that goal setting in place. Again, we're hearing one-on-one -on -one conversations, right? Communication. You want to focus on outcomes, right? We're gathering up, but ultimately we're looking to drive results. We're going to look to define career growth and advancement during the performance management review. Change management. The only thing constant in the marketplace today is that one word change. There is rapid change occurring day in and day out. Some generational uh, employees in the workforce deal with it better than others. Um, change management is something that needs to be discussed during performance management. Okay. Reviewing the mentorship opportunities, you know, um, Jeff and Quint were talking about their experiences. You know, it's critical to ask the individual during performance management, would you be interested in mentorship, right? You're going to know if that uh, individual fits the uh, traits and results to actually be a mentor, but that's a great opportunity to groom for mentorship opportunities. Again, that's going to give them pride in what they're doing day in and day out. You want to recognize and reward and discuss that cross um, training for other positions as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pause again. Michelle, we, we're, we're running tight on time. I want to make sure you have enough time for the employee engagement because there's some really good data on how kind of to wrap all this up and get a measurement on anything. But if you have a quick thing you'd like to add on performance management, please do. If not, we'll transition over to the employee engagement. Yeah, I mean, just very quickly, I think similar to what we were talking about with onboarding is, you know, to really assess like what you want to measure. I think that's the important part. You know, it could be competencies, it could be goals, but just make it make sense for the employee population. You know, the last thing you want is somebody being measured on a competency or goal that has nothing to do with their day-to-day -day job. So I know that here, you know, we I work with my clients to really kind of look at, okay, what is it that you want to measure and then build a plan based on that. And then, like I said, similar to onboarding, it's creating the plan, leveraging your, your HR and payroll system um, for automation, and then communication and training. With performance management, you want to train managers on how to provide that feedback uh, correctly um, and appropriately, and also you know, utilizing the system appropriately for conducting those performance management assessments. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michelle. All right, we're going to go ahead and transition over to employee engagement. Um, before we kind of get into some of the, the points listed here, just wanted to remind everyone, I think we know this, but keep in mind, again, these are best practices, right? This is not the end all be all. Uh, your organization is unique to what you do. Your staff is as well. Um, one of the huge values that we provide our clients at Puzzle is ensuring that we're creating a customized solution for their specific business needs. You know, each business, again, is unique. It's not a one-size-fits-all onboarding program. What you've done in the past, what you're doing today, and what you want to do tomorrow, those are all elements that need to be, um, you know, part of the, the process in developing these items we're talking about. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and transition to the last item, employee engagement. This is big, right? Because if you have an engaged workforce, right, what's going to happen? You're going to have happy employees. I know Quint it loves what he does for a living. I see him out there day in and day out. Um, they're two times more productive if you have an engaged, happy employee. You're going to be loyal, right, to your job. You're going to want to stay longer. You're going to be more energized. You see some other stats here. We lean on Sherm a lot. Some of these stats are pretty eye-catching, right? It gets your attention. Happy employees are going to use less sick time, right? They're going to they're going to work longer, harder. They're going to want to help their colleagues. They're going to be excited about what they do. And ultimately, they're going to achieve their goals, you know, more than someone who's not happy, right? Um, but when you hear employee engagement, it may be one of those things, what exactly does that mean, right? What is employee engagement? I've heard the buzzword. Um, I know we need to have, you know, a way to measure engagement. What does it mean? That's what we're seeing here, quality of life, what the company does to enhance the work environment and encourage work-life balance. I know Charles is on here with BKS. Um, I'm just referencing some people that I know and some organizations that I know 
There's a lot of companies represented here, but I know BKS has an incredible quality of life, work-life balance program. I've seen it in action, right? Um, work, how the employer manages resources, how they organize work tasks and process for employees to have a sense of accomplishment. Culture, how senior leadership selects employees and prioritizes engagement. Is it a priority within the company to have an engaged workforce? You'll see that from the senior leadership that flows down. That's a big part of what Puzzle HR does. Our workforce is extremely engaged. We have an incredible culture. That's because we implement employee engagement, which you're seeing here. Total rewards, how employees value pay, benefits, recognition, and overall compensation, and then the, the company practices. Um, are they aligning with the company brand? Um, is there diversity and reputation um, to deliver an engaged workforce? I'm going to go ahead and, and turn the floor over to Michelle because how do you measure employee engagement? That's key. And not only measuring it, but applying it. So, Michelle, we have a short period of time to go through this quickly. I wish we had more time. But if you don't mind hitting um, the indexing, if you will, that we do at Puzzle. Sure, sure. Yeah. So one tool that I think has been very effective and our clients really love, and I, I highly recommend that if you've never done an employee engagement survey that you contemplate using this tool for yourselves um, at some point, you know, when the timing is right. I mean, everybody says when's the right time, right? Well, obviously, you know, um, you have to gauge that upon your own organization. But the, the tool that we use here at Puzzle, I like because we kind of break it down into these five parts. So I know we're limited on time and I'm not going to get into each of these, you know, specifics in each of these. But what I would like to mention is that, you know, you see culture and engagement there in the center. Um, I've had some clients that have been very hesitant uh, to do engagement surveys because they're like, oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I'm scared to know what people think. But you know, the reality is that even those clients that I've had that feel that way end up getting results that they're pleasantly surprised with. And what I mean by that is, you know, you're never going to be able to please everyone, right? So even if you have the best organization, uh, the best, you know, workforce and culture, you're always going to have, you know, some uh, constructive feedback and maybe others that don't give you that, that constructive feedback, maybe a little more than you would like, right? But the point is that, um, you know, a lot of these surveys, they give us such beneficial information, culture and engagement, you'll see there as part three, but it's in the center of these groups, because if you're doing well in that area, it is going to eventually trickle into these other areas as long as you listen to the feedback that you're receiving. Um, so I think that when you get, you know, when you have a survey like this and you go through the data, once you, you see the results, this is what we use here. And I think it's important because one thing is conducting the survey. And then the next part is actually communicating the results of the survey. So employees know, hey, here's the areas that we scored really well in. Here's the areas that we need to work on. And then from that, you take that feedback and you build upon initiatives. Now, you know, are you going to be able to change everything overnight? Absolutely not. Um, however, it's a it's a building, you know, it's it's a foundation for initiatives to come and what you can do with those, re those results. You know, if you're having big issues in onboarding, I know that was our first topic. Well, then maybe you need to kind of prioritize that in your HR initiatives and say, you know what, let me take a step back and start with onboarding and really listen to what the employees said so that we can make this a successful, you know, organization and have high employee retention. Um, so I think that, you know, those are, those are some key points. There's a lot more to it, but those are some key points with regards to really diving into the engagement and um, assessing employees feedback. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle. We are wrapping up right at 1145. A couple few points just to summarize. Um, you know, when it comes to engagement surveys, that's really getting a temperature or pulse. The C-suite, you know, the leadership, they may think that the um, processes in place are, are, are getting things done. When they hear from the staff, they're hearing something different. And this is the tool that we can utilize to share with them, kind of look under the hood, kind of look behind the curtain. And there's many engagement surveys outside of Puzzle as well. Um, this is just one tool that we use with our clients, but obviously you may have been through one on your own at some level um, throughout the life cycle of, of employment with employees. So it's a great tool and it also is so important to apply the results. It's one thing to get the results, but if you don't do anything with them, you know, you might as well not take the survey. So application is critical. Um, the last point, I just want to thank Beth and Bama and everyone on this call for the opportunity to share a little bit about one of the biggest challenges we're hearing day in and day out 
and that's winning the war on employee turnover, right? And hopefully we've had a few discussions today that's opened your eyes and things that you could course correct and keep that talent within your organization. With that being said, Beth, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you and, and any uh, Q&As if we have time. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you, Michelle, for your time today. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask before we wrap up? Uh, general questions, Jeff Perkins. Uh, do you, so your company uh, supports these uh, surveys? You talk to the management, and here are the questions we're going to issue. And it's like uh, in a process of, uh, you know, that's completely autonomous. And the employees respond, and then you summarize those for the uh, company. Is that how you do that? Yeah, I can answer that one. Yeah, so yes, exactly that way. We um, we usually, we leave it up to our clients whether they want us to send the communication. Many times they do, because it kind of, you know, makes that separation between the company and then us coming in as their HR, you know, third party uh, support. And so, yes, we send it out to employees. We gather the data, Puzzle HR. The company doesn't even know the, the results until we get the final results presented to them. Um, and so we administer it through a survey monkey. Um, and we it's about two weeks, sometimes longer, depending on how much participation we have the first two weeks. And then our team puts together basically all the data, summarizes the key important uh, data that we get back, and then we present it to our clients so that then we can have takeaways to discuss and build initiatives upon that data that we receive. Yeah, we did one from our corporate uh, you know, a couple of years ago, and uh, yeah, it was very, very useful. Fortunately, the results you know, were overall quite positive, which is a nice encouragement. But I think more important, uh, we demonstrated that based on the inputs, and you know, we did something with it, and and it just was the timing in the world and the industry. You know, we did some big things like we implemented a 980 uh, schedule, uh, some uh, remote flexibility, uh, you know, and a couple other things, which. You know, frankly, right. like you said, if you don't do something with it, I'm convinced the next time you do it, uh, really, no one would participate. Exactly. Yep. You got that right. That's that's so the key. Right definitely, there. Uh, you know, would put a uh, endorsement for the uh, survey idea because uh, you know, it was definitely helpful. Yes, very much so. Thank you so much for your feedback, Jeff. And I would also like to thank Krista Gardner from PDR, CPA and Advisors, for putting this webinar together for us. She's part of our professional development team and chairs that committee. So thank you, Krista, for your help. We do have another webinar coming up in October, Production Planning for Success, Effective Production Planning Strategies. And that will be on October 12th from 11 till 12. And that registration is also open if you'd like to register for that upcoming webinar. Uh, again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Do we have any last comments or questions before we wrap up? I wanted to thank Krista as well. Krista, I, I keep thanking Bama, but I thank you as well. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for, for Bama. Thank you. Yes. Well, thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon, and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you. Thank everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.